Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Dr. Saurabh Biswas from Texas A&M University at College Station, Texas. I'm close to Houston and welcome to the workshop, Building a Technology Startup from University-Based Innovations. Uh, let me start by thanking my colleagues at Texas A&M Cutter and also organizers for uh, giving me the opportunity to come and speak to you. I looked at the agenda of the conference and it's very impressive. A set of presentations and meetings that's going you, you are going to see from a lot of speakers. So uh, what I'm hoping to do today through these presentations is talk about how to take ideas from academia. And by academia, I mean research that is done on campus. If you're a graduate student, you're a faculty, or if you're an entrepreneur who wants to take a research done in the labs and bring it to market, how do we do that? And why that is important because it's very critical for us to take these ideas to the next level so that we can really use it for impacting the society and the same point of time for building products that can change the way a lot of products have already done. So briefly, my background, uh, I have been in academia pretty much all along my life, close to 20 years in uh, innovation. As a scientist, I've been involved in healthcare. So my basic background is in biomedical engineering and finance. I've been an inventor of multiple medical devices, uh, mostly in the healthcare space, ultrasound device, treating heart failure and for treating stroke. Uh, I have uh, been a co-founder or senior management in multiple uh, startup companies, mostly again associated with healthcare. And some of these companies are in the early stages of its evolution. Some of these companies uh, have, are pretty new one, but all of them have been involved in commercializing a device which was created or invented in an academic lab. I've spent quite some time on eight years in venture capital where I led a fund mostly for investing in early stage companies. And more so at this point, I'm involved as a faculty again and also leading the commercialization for Texas a and Engineering. So my background has been all along in helping, working with faculty and also as a scientist, take ideas from early stages in academia to the next level in the industry. During the presentation, please feel free to send any questions my way. We will try to answer it while we are moving forward. But at the end too, I will finish my presentation around 45 minute mark. So we will be able to discuss some of the questions that you might have. So one of the questions we all ask is why do we need to commercialize academic research? What is the value of doing that? And one of the key things is impact. The things we do in academia are typically so early in its evolution. The impact is the most important thing we try to get is how we can impact the society, how the research you are doing in your laboratory, how if you're a student in a lab working on your PhD or doctoral dissertation, and if you're an entrepreneur who is working with the faculty, how you can take these ideas to the next level and impact the society. And that's the reason we try to commercialize our academic research. If you take a look at an example, and I will take you through a couple of them, the work we do in academia is typically very early stage. If you look at this uh, graphic here, we are on the extreme left side where we are talking R&D. And typically that research has to go through multiple stages of seed funding, pilot demonstration, commercialization before it goes to market. So there are significant challenges when you are an inventor, when you are in academic lab, you have significant challenges in taking that idea to market. And what we will do during the workshop today is take you through some of the processes, which are very critical for you as an entrepreneur, as a faculty, or if you're a student who wants to start a company, kind of have a good feel of these processes and also build a team to do that. So you can see that when we take these very early stage ideas, what we have here called a technological value of debt. And it's a pretty commonly used word in the world of entrepreneurship, where we have this situation where you have enough funding to build a prototype, but there's no funding to take it to the next level to go and test it or validate it or build a platform. In case of medical devices, can you test it in a large animal? In case of materials, can you scale up the material? Can you manufacture enough materials for application in oil and gas, an application for polymeric industry? So this, these are the challenges why you create a startup company as an entrepreneur to raise funding external to the research funding that has already come either through government or industry and try to take the product to the next, next level. 
So these are the challenges that you as an entrepreneur, you have to face. You have to build a strategy so that how you can take it to the next level. So at this point, all the things we do in the university are on the left side, which is the R&D stage. The primary goal of a startup company is really to take it to the next level, which is prototype, proof of concept, keep raising funding, to raise funding to move it towards a pilot and demonstration before you are able to take it to the next level, which will be commercialization, selling it in the market, having revenue, build a team and take it to the next stage. So very, very critical for you as an entrepreneur to understand that you have this challenge in front of you. And then you try to figure out what are the strategies you can have to surmount these challenges so that you can slowly build up a startup company for inception. And we will discuss some of the strategies in the workshop today. Uh, I have my email uh, in the first slide, which I shared with you, and you can get it from organizers. Feel free to reach out to me with any questions during the workshop or even after the workshop. I'll be very glad to help you. Uh, so these are some of the examples. All of you have seen these names, I'm sure. Well, Qualcomm, Apple, and Google. I think everything we are doing now, you are sitting with your phone, we are watching something on the screen, uh, things are flying through the cloud, through the internet. These three companies have changed the world. And But the unique thing, which is very interesting here, what you see on the left top, which is NSF and National Science Foundation, all of these three companies were created with basic fundamental innovations and inventions which came out from university. Qualcomm, which is one of the biggest companies which makes these chips for 4G, 5G, and pretty much every cell phone in the world has a Qualcomm chip. It was a small grant funding to faculty member to start a company in late 1970s in San Diego. And that is how the company started. It was a research project by two faculty members in electrical engineering. They wanted to start a company and it started off as a small startup company. And what is Qualcomm today, which is a multi-billion dollar global corporation, was an outshoot of an academic research project. Google, you know, I don't think there's anyone in the world at this point who does not use Google as a verb. Google started off as a project for two PhD students in uh, mid 90s, funded by National Science Foundation, a digital library project. So it wasn't start up, started off as a project as Google. So it started off as just a funded project, like a lot of us who have done PhDs uh, get started with our projects in the lab. And in first two to three years, the team worked on a project. They figured out they have a very interesting search engine. That's when they started comparing the search engine with uh, Yahoo and other existing search engines in 90s. And they figured out their page rank method was very powerful. And that was the genesis of Google. And what you see on the Apple phone, most of the processors, displays, batteries, and all of these components, they all came out from academic research. So what is the message here? The message here is though I showed in the previous slide that there are a lot of technical challenges, a lot of financial challenges that you take in academic ideas to next steps. There have been the greatest innovations that you see today in the world came out from academic research. So if you are an entrepreneur, if you are a faculty or if you are a faculty who wants to be an entrepreneur or a student who wants to be an entrepreneur, it's an extremely exciting space to be. You are able to impact the whole world with innovations that is coming out of lab. You have to work together with a lot of people to make it happen, that it is one of the most interesting things that you can do in your career. So this is the academic ecosystem we live in. We all are part of an academic ecosystem. Fine if you are, again, a student, faculty, entrepreneur, and most of the universities are doing what we have here in this figure at the center, which is core research and education. So if you're planning to form a startup company with your innovation, which is coming out from this core research and innovation, you are taking one of those ideas and try to get out of this box by utilizing multiple different support systems that universities have. They have startup incubation, you go to technology licensing, you do an entrepreneurship program or an internship, you can get some funding, uh, you can get IP support, industry university collaborative programs, and then you have investors in the region. So all the, this whole support system is very critical for your innovation to go from the first level to the next, which is typically to the company formation and commercialization. Uh, in my discussions with uh, Qatar Foundation, the person leading the intellectual property management, you have a lot of these support systems existing 
uh, through those offices. So my suggestion will be to start talking to those groups. If you are in the early stages of thinking that you want to take an idea to the next level. So this is very critical for you to understand that what is an academic ecosystem because you are residing in that and how you can be part of that process. If you're external to this process, how you can go in and be part of this process, working with the faculty, working with the student to take their ideas to the next level. So what are the different pathways to market? How do you take ideas from an academia, a technical idea to market? There are multiple ways to do that. One is entrepreneurship, which is what we are talking today, how to create a startup company from academic innovations. And the other route is licensing, licensing this to the large or smaller companies. So when we are talking entrepreneurship, we are talking formation of a new company to take an idea to the next level, which is typically trying to commercialize an innovation by finding out ways to do that. What are the typical reasons we choose that? Because it's always there could be a big company who has all the resources, the people, the money to do these things. So why do we typically try to build a startup company? Something which doesn't sound that smart when you know the challenges that you have. So there is a process sometimes why you choose a startup. In case of licensing, which is done to bigger company, in most cases, it represents an incremental improvement to existing technology. You are not disrupting the market. Startups, typically you are developing an idea or a technology which is going to change the way how you do it. So it is not conventional. So in those cases, you have to choose a startup. Another example is when you have a platform technology. By that, I mean when you are using a technology like a material science, where a novel material could be used in multiple different industries. You can use it in aerospace, you can use it in medical, you can use it in nuclear, you can use it in retail. So when you have a material which you can use in three, four, five different industries, you can choose the route at that point of a startup company because then you can go after each of these industries and talk about innovation. Sometimes the technology is so new, there are no licensees you can find in the industry or public sector. At that time, startup is the only way to get the ball rolling, get some validation, prove to the world that you can build something on top of it. And certainly in the end, again, the broad range of applications you want to try out, you can form a startup. Same on the market side, you are forming a new market. It is high risk. Typically an existing company might not want to get you a new market with the product. So you form a startup company. And most, of, most importantly, when the market is significantly large with growth potential, startups are uh, typically are very successful because we are, they are able to raise a lot of money. So these are the technical and market considerations you have to look at when you are deciding, should I form a startup company or should I go and license it to a large company like a Dow Chemical or uh, any of these large uh, R&D based companies who can take your technology to the next level. So these are some of the processes you have to go through as an entrepreneur in deciding that if I have an idea, how do I address the idea to take it to the next level? So what is the goal of a startup? This is a very simple statement. And at the same point, we want to keep it very simple that you have an idea, you have a technology and you want to form a startup company. So what is the goal of that company? And mostly more so when we are talking academic startups, what is the goal of that startup? So there are the very three simple things you want to do in a startup company. One is mitigating the technology risk. By that, I mean, you have an idea which is very high risk and early stage. By mitigating the risk, I mean, you have to show, you have to come up with evidence, you have to come up with the data to show your technology does what it is supposed to do. And you can mitigate that risk internally within your university. You can mitigate that risk in the company. But basically goal is you're reducing the risk to a point where an acquisition or a large company can come, take your ideas and bring it to the market quickly. And you can bring it to the market quickly by raising a lot of capital that everybody there is looking at one single thing. Do you have less risk than when you started before? Number two, very simple, build a great product. Because end of the day, a starter company has no value if nobody comes and buys your product. That is the most important consideration. As an entrepreneur, you have to keep thinking, will someone write a check or swipe their credit card or give me money to buy the product? If you have no revenue, there is no company. So as a startup, you have to make that leap from technology to product. 
which is very, very critical for you as a founder, as a manager, as a CEO of the company, that you need to come up with the product strategy, the transition from technology to product. And last one, the most basic, but benefit the shareholders. A startup company is a group of people who have invested time and money. So end of the day, if a startup company's shareholders do not get an exit, or there is no financial return for them, there is no startup company. Typically, most of them shut down. And a very interesting fact, I think most of you might not know, there was a very large survey of close to uh, 7,000 companies, startup companies, early stage companies, and the survey was, uh, what, do, what are the reasons typically startups fail? And very interestingly, when I ask the questions, when I do the workshops all over the world, is why do startups fail? People raise their hand for technical reasons they fail, or financial reasons they fail. But the most interesting thing was most of the startups fail because they're building something which no one needs and no one cares. So millions of dollars are raised every day by startup companies not knowing and what they're bringing to market will anyone will ever buy. So the second point here, build a great product that customer will like and buy is one of the most critical things you as an entrepreneur will have to figure out that does anyone care to buy what I'm building? If that does not happen, number three will be pretty much off the rail because nobody is going to benefit as a shareholder because you are neither exiting nor making any money. So it brings us to a point which happens a lot in academia uh, where a professor or a student or entrepreneur knowing a professor comes to the table and say, hey, I have a great idea to start up a company. Give me some money and I think we are going to build a great company. And they go to an investor, they pitch an idea and the outcome is pretty sad because most investors at that point say, hey, I have no clue what you guys want to do, what you want to build. You have no team. I just don't know if you even have a product which customers care and they typically are not funded. And this is what we'd want to avoid by a process where we can look at some critical skill sets you want to have as an entrepreneur that I have used in my career as an entrepreneur. I'm close to 20 years now uh, building companies out of academia. I've seen companies in every discipline from nuclear to medical, you name it, in 14 to 15 different areas. And what are the things we are trying to avoid here is to not get into this situation where you build a company, you go to an investor, you ask for money and their response is, hey, you don't have anything here. We don't want to invest in your company. So that's the goal. So that was my first segment of the presentation here is why academic research is critical in taking these our ideas to market and create an impact. Number two, as an entrepreneur, what are the critical things you need to understand to create an economic value in a startup company? And what are the determinants of why you should license the technology from an academic setup, which could be the licensing office in a university or from a person to, and take it to market. We will move on to the next segment. Now, if there are any questions, feel free to uh, put questions in the chat. I will move on to the next segment after this. <clears throat> So there's a very simple approach here that I've laid out. Now, how do you go from an ideation and invention on the left and you can just go down in an S shape? It's really first of the, the first two things, ideation and R&D cycle and prototyping. That's what you're doing a lot in an university or in a technology startup. There are a few things, which is a skill set we'll talk about. There are other, the three things I want to talk about today after this from a skill set standpoint where you need to have a knowledge. Remember, you don't have to know everything. That's why you build a team. You cannot be that one person who knows everything. Yeah, if you do it long time, like at this point, I'm doing it for two decades. I understand a lot of these things while doing it. But if you're starting a company or if you're a faculty member who wants to start a company, you don't need to know everything. You don't need to be an expert in all of these areas. What you need to do is to find people who can help you what you need to do is go to people who can point you in directions of experts. But in my experience, these are the 14 steps I've seen are typically the pathway to creating a company. Ideation and invention, R&D cycle, this is staying in the university. Then you make a decision on IP and protection strategy. And this is where the concept of patents come in. I know you have some presentations, workshops, 
happening in the IP space, we will touch very briefly, but that's a very, very critical strategy. If you're building a technology startup, you need to have a strategy to protect your IP because without that, your company has no value. Identifying the market, identifying competition, very, very critical step. If you do not understand your market, if you do not know who is your competition, chances are you're going to quickly fail. Moment you go and present to investor, and if their first search comes out that they know a competition and you don't know, that will look really bad. Team, the sixth box. Team is something very critical because end of the day, if you think the technology is an important thing in a company, you are wrong. The ideal, the ideal startup company is a place where you have a founding team who are complementing each other's strength. There could be friends, there could be colleagues, but they all need to have a separate skill set so that they can bring technology and business together to form the company. You have to figure out what resources you need. Then you have the IP licensing strategy. We talked about IP protection strategy. Now we are talking IP licensing strategy, how you can get the intellectual property in your company so that you have the rights to go and commercialize it. Then you figure out the financial need. Advisors, you cannot hire a lot of people in a startup company because you don't have the money. But there are advisors who can join your company in the board or as an advisor. Incorporate the company. This can happen early too. But typically, I suggest once you have looked at most of these things in the top 10 boxes, the 11th box is you form the company now because now you have the people, you have the knowledge to go out and start uh, raising the funding uh, to execute on all the steps you will need to take it to the next level. Uh, finally, the last two boxes is more iterative, where you expand the team, you launch the products, and then hopefully you follow the process, you have revenue in the company, you can grow. So this is really, in some sense, the simple process that you have to go through in a step-by-step -step approach. It looks like a long list of things, but this happens pretty logically. So what we are going to do this for next uh, 15 minutes, we are looking going to look at some of the fundamental processes that I use a lot as a tool. And what you will be using, and this is something is your uh, personal preference, but one of the key things that, as I mentioned, that why most companies fail because their business model is wrong. They are not supporting, or they are not building something which anybody cares about. So business model refinement is a very critical thing. So there are a lot of concepts out there a lean startup, agile thinking. This is a mix and match of different philosophies of taking your idea to market. So what we are going to do here, and this is a tool which is becoming very popular now, is this Osterweiler's Building Blocks of Innovation, which is a concept of business model canvas. And what business model canvas does is very simple. It's a very intuitive and logical thing. What it tells you as an entrepreneur to do is instead of writing a 60, 70, 100 page business plan is start looking at the whole business into nine simple quadrants that you have this nine different pieces if you are looking at it if you're able to figure out you can move forward and start your business and you can make a decision of yes or no both are very fair decision so let's look at it this is the quadrant is called the business model canvas and you can see that it has numbers one there is the right side and the left side the, the right side is called the revenue side and the left side is called the cost side. So for any business, there is a cost of running a business. It could be anything. If you start a uh, food stall, there's a cost side of things because you have to buy stuff, you have to do things. And there's a revenue side of things. And you will always want your revenue to be more than cost because that's when you make money. So what you have on the right side are the very important things. The value proposition, but primarily the most important thing is what problem you are solving. And this goes back to that question is why startups fail? Because most startups think they're solving a problem, but in fact, they're not solving a problem at all. So think of a company like Google. So technically what problem Google is solving here is it is helping you to find things quickly. So there's a difference between value proposition and the technical merits of technology. We are not talking here about technology. You're talking here as a value to your customer. So that's what is value proposition. So with Google, you can search something very quickly. Nobody talks about the algorithm Google is using. Nobody talks about millions and millions of servers they have. That's not the point here. The point is what value you are giving to the customer. What needs of customer you are satisfying. What specific product or service you're providing. 
So the first thing you have to do is understand the value proposition. The number two customer, who is your customer? You have to understand that. Now, in some cases, like in cases of medical devices, if you, have, if you have a device for treating stroke, that's pretty clear and simple. You know who, who is your customer. But most engineering technologies, you need to go and figure out who is that customer who really has the pain point that you're trying to solve. If you're not able to find that customer segment, you can build a product, you can go to market, but nobody's going to sign that check because the customer you're reaching out is wrong. And three and four are two very critical pieces is customer relationship and channels through which you can reach a customer. Because one of the things we all know there, now there is a lot of different ways to reach a customer. It's just not physical ways of reaching them. In some cases, that's the only way in large industries. If you're in nuclear industry, if you're in aerospace industry, things are happening at a scale which are very different than in software where social media and all these things become very critical pieces. So three and four connects one and two. Is how do you build that bridge between one and two? You have a value proposition, you have a customer segment, how you can connect the customer segment and the channel to, channels together, and you have to spend significant amount of time. Now, how do you do that? What we typically do and what I suggest when I do these workshops is talking to a potential customer. You can talk to 20, 30, 50, 100 potential customers, and you can just go and talk to them. And you talk to them as a hypothesis that, hey, I have this product, or I have an idea to solve this problem. What are your pain points today? If they are telling you, hey, I really hate to solve this. Um, I'm in this problem which I, where I need a solution. I hate the existing solutions. That gives you an idea where to go and solve the problem. So the one and two are connected to three and four, because once you figure out who is your customer, you are then able to figure out, number one, how to build that relationship, because it is all about relationship when it comes to repeat business, and then what are the channels through which you can reach that customer. And that will drive your revenue. If you do the right side right, revenues will happen. But if you're not able to connect the one and two, that's where the disconnect, that's where businesses fail. Now we move on to the left side. The left side is execution, it is operations of the company. Key activities. What are the activities you have to do to really take the company from conception or formation to a point of execution? This involves everything. It involves things like market analysis, product analysis. You have to go out and look at manufacturing, everything depending on your product. If it requires a software company, you have to look at how much servers, uh, what kind of programming you will need. So you have to look at all the activities you have to do to build the product. Key resources, what resources will you need? And this is requires physical resources, technical resources, human resources, all the different resources which are required in a company to execute on the product. And number seven is key partners. One of the things about academic ideas at deep tech, it's very, very difficult to execute without partners because of the high risk involved in the process. So you have to go and identify key partners who will be supporting you through various kinds of relationships. And five, six, and seven, once it comes together, you are able to now execute on the vision on the right side. So right and left side are very connected. Once you are clear with the customer segment and you understand now what on the operational level you have to do, you have to have a good feel of the cost structure because the cost structure tells you how much money you are going to raise to build the company. So once you have these nine quadrants a little bit clear in your mind with your idea. So if you start with an idea that you have a novel material which changes shape when you heat it at a certain temperature, maybe that's the technology you start with. You figure out this customer segment, who are the ones who need that kind of a material or what kind of applications. You build a relationship with them. You figure out a channel, which is how you stay connected to these customers. You come to the left side of the canvas the left side of the campus, you figure out what are the key activities you need to have in the company to build that kind of a material. Then what resources you will need, including financial, intellectual property, manufacturing, hiring people, all of those things in the resource side. Do you need a partner? Because you might need a supplier, you might need a strategic partner. So you figure that out. Once you have this one to seven clear, you go to the financial side of things, which is cost structure and revenue. You have to come up with a pricing strategy, fine, because now you know your cost structure, 
that it takes you a million dollars to run the company per month. So if your cost structure is $12 million a year, you have to come up with a revenue model where you are making sig significantly more than $12 million you are spending every year to come up with a viable business model. So that's why this tool is called Business Model Canvas. Instead of spending a lot of time writing a business plan, most investors today ask entrepreneurs that have you gone through an exercise like this? Now, this is a tool. This is not the only tool. You can use part of this uh, quadrants. You don't need to use all of them. But typically, once you go through this process, you can make a decision, number one, should I even do this business? A decision could be, no, I don't want to do this because I cannot find the right customer segment. Or when I spoke with people in the customer segment, they just said, hey, we do not need anything like this. Then that's a good place to stop instead of using millions of dollars being spent on building a product, which end of the day, nobody will buy. So reaching a no decision is a valuable decision too. You don't have to always try to reach a point where you force yourself to a yes, because business would eventually fail in that situation. You can move on to the next idea. So business model canvas is a great tool for all entrepreneurs and you don't need to have an expert. You could be a student in the lab. You can do this exercise with your co-founder, with your team, take the technology, start at number one, go through hole one to nine and try to figure out at the end of the day that is it not end of the day, it sometimes takes three to six months to do the process, gather enough data points and make a decision. And that point, it's a data-driven decision that if you want to reach a decision of no, it's perfectly okay because eventually the business would have failed anyway if you've gone forward. And if you go through the process and everything looks good, it's a fantastic way to raise money because most investors now know that you have done the homework of identifying the right and left side of this business model canvas and the numbers in your cost structure make sense because you went through a process. Uh, it's an example of LinkedIn. We all use LinkedIn in our day-to-day -day activities. You can see that this is really a layout of LinkedIn's uh, business model canvas, that their value propositions, and it's a professional network, reaching the right talent, reaching the target audience, and a lot of companies use LinkedIn APIs. So there you will be filling up forms where they say, you know, give a LinkedIn link. So these are APIs. So that's the value proposition they're giving to customers. So if you're using LinkedIn, that's a value. On the right side, number two customer segment, users, internet users, recruiters, advertisers, developers. So that's the customer segment of that company. And then they have the relationships and channels, how they are staying connected with the customer. When you go to the left side, you will see the key activities, which is the platform development that's going on, which is the software platform and key resources. You know, what kind of resources they need to build a company like that, which is now a multi-billion dollar global company. And key partners on the extreme left, you can see they have as their access to multiple educational tools or access to multiple learning tools. These are the partners. LinkedIn itself does not build them, but they're partners who work with LinkedIn to build those things. So when you come down to number eight and nine, you can see the cost structure. So they have web hosting costs, their marketing and sales costs, their product development, their GNA. So this is the cost of running a company. So the cost of running LinkedIn might be $150 million a month. So they have figured out the cost structure. Now the revenue stream, what is the revenue? The revenue is coming through. Recruiters pay their money. Um, I pay them. Like, for example, I am um, a premium member of LinkedIn, so I pay a monthly subscription. So there are these free solutions, the subscription solutions, and then there are recruiters who have special specific access to the whole LinkedIn database by getting access to the right people they want to hire, and they make money through that process. So this is a very, very simple example to show you that you can take any concept that you have, take a printout of this on the web. There are plenty of business model canvas templates out there, and you can really go through this process. You can talk to potential companies, and most companies are quite uh, supportive when you are going to them and talking to them saying, hey, I have an idea. We are trying to come up with a business model canvas, and what I'm really looking at, what is your pain point? What is the problem you have? I am working on this idea. Does it look like a potential solution? If not, what you're looking for? So please utilize this tool when you are coming up with an idea or working on an existing idea, because this information is going to help you a lot in your process as you build the company. So this was one of the things that I wanted to talk about out of three things. 
which is how to utilize business model canvas in a decision making process. Uh, next, we are going to IP. I, we are not going to spend a lot of time because I know you have a full segment of IP uh, coming up. But one of the key things that you as an entrepreneur, technology entrepreneur, you have to be mindful of is the value of IP in taking a concept to market. It is one of the most critical pieces of value that you're building in the company. When you build a company, the most important value in the company is the intellectual property because the team is new. Unless until the team has a lot of experience, you really don't have much value in the team. So your intellectual property is the asset you have, and it's very critical to understand why you need to do two things. One, protect the IP, and secondly, when you are doing a transaction, when you're licensing the IP, how you need to have knowledge. Now, you will be, chances are working with an expert, working with a law firm. You yourself, if you're a scientific person, are not going to do this, but you need to have some understanding and knowledge of why this is so critical. This is just a, <clears throat> a uh, piece of information that one of the most valuable pieces of IP uh, in the world is the uh, first patent on uh, telephone and telegraph, which is at some point was known as an AT&T as a company, but this was when Alexander Graham Bell invented the telephone. And trillions and trillions of dollars have been created out of value. Today, this, even the phones we use, it all connects back to this late 1800s. You can see that a patent that came out. These were some of the biggest fights that happened in the world of patents. And you have to understand these fights happen because of billions of dollars which were at stake for these very, very critical patents, which are the foundation of company like AT&T and uh, Bell Labs in the early uh, 1900s. Uh, so just to give you, show you why patent matters, companies like Apple, they are pr protecting everything. As you can see on the left side, uh, you, even the boxes in which you get the Apple phones, they have design patterns. And what you see on the right side is this mesh of all these arrows. This is nothing else that shows the number of lawsuits or how these companies have filed a lawsuit against each other because they think somebody else is stealing the patents. And why this is happening? Because the value of the patent. Patent is a business strategy. All of the companies here, as you again see in these arrows, they're suing each other for one reason, for competitive advantage. So if you're building a company, patent provides you the competitive advantage because patent protection prevents someone else from copying your stuff or doing the same thing you are doing. Because remember, when you're raising money, when you're asking someone, hey, put $1 million in my company, they are putting the money in your company so that you are the only one who is going to commercialize the product. And they're not there 10 people doing it. Now, when there are 10 people doing it, you need to have some other kind of advantage but in the technology entrepreneurship, IP is a key advantage you need to have. I will not go into details of these things, but these are the things you need to know. As an IP, what are the few different uh, ways in which IP gets created, trademarks, trade secrets, uh, brands, licenses, design, but most importantly, the last two, which most of the time happens in academic environment or in a university, is software copyrights and inventions which are protected as patents. So chances are, you will be the working with software, which will be protected as a copyrighted material, or you'll be working with inventions, which will be protected as a patent. And most of the time, these will be the two most important things that you will be uh, protecting. So you will be the one who will initiate the conversation with the technology transfer office, typically through an uh, invention disclosure or some kind of a process like that. And then they will be profiling a patent in your country, in the United States and all over the world. And that will be the first step. Because if you miss the step, you have to remember all the time, moment you publish, you lose the rights for IP protection. So if you're serious about taking your idea to next step as a founder, as a scientist, you have to protect your idea before you publish. it. All over the world, outside the United States, moment you publish something, there is no more intellectual property rights. The moment there's a publication, you lose your intellectual property rights. In the United States, still you have one year within which you can go and protect it, but slowly with time, they will change it to the global standards. So again, very, very important before you have a publication coming up or your dissertation or your thesis is going out, you need to protect your idea. So this is on the creation side of things. <clears throat> Where your idea is created, how do you, how do you want to protect it? Uh, then there's this timeline. It requires time and money. 
So when you have an evaluation of an invention disclosure submitted to your office, you certainly have a timeline where the provisional patent is filed. Internationally, you will do conversion to PCT, which after some time gives you access to close to 200 countries in which now you can go and file your patent. Typically, you have to, at that point, make a decision which countries you want to file because it's a very expensive process too. Uh, two weeks back, I looked at a company which was filing in 13 countries uh, for four patents and the cost was $600,000. So it's very expensive when you are looking at the global IP portfolio or a global patent strategy. But at the same point for growing your business, you need to have a good understanding of the global landscape and which countries to protect. So when you do business in that country, you are able to utilize your patent and have a competitive advantage. The other piece of IP that you need to <clears throat> think about is when you're licensing it. Because this is different from protection. So the your idea was protected. It's within the university. Now the next step is how can you take the idea from university to your company? And that happens through this intellectual property licensing or through an option. So there, these are the multiple terms that I've laid out. We are not going into the details of each of these terms because that itself is a, a half a day process. But you have to understand there are some legal terms where you might work with the law firm to understand what would be royalty, what's the equity you are giving to the university. Basically, it's a give and take so that you have the rights, the technology, which in this situation might be owned by the Texas A&M Cutter. The research was done in Tamu Q, and you as an entrepreneur wants to commercialize the technology. So you will go to the Tammy Q, Tammy Q or Cutter Foundation Technology Transfer Office and say that, hey, I want to start a company. I want to license the technology from you. And these are some of the terms that you will be negotiating with them. The upfront license fee, what is the royalty you will pay them. Royalty is typically the revenue, a percentage of revenue on the product, 3%, 5%, 7%. So if your product is making million dollars a year, you'll come back and pay Tammy Q a royalty of five to 7%. And then sometimes you give equity. Field of use is very important because you want to typically have a global field of use that in every application, in every region of the world, you want to have the rights to that technology. And then you have payments, you have milestones. Uh, there are multiple other things, like stacking provisions, paying back the past patent costs. But again, as an entrepreneur, as a CEO of a company or as a founder, you need to have an understanding of what the IP strategy might look like when you are going out to build the company. So this was the second piece. So first, business model canvas. Second, a quick understanding of IP creation side of thing and IP licensing side of things. And third piece, which you have to understand is when you're raising money, how the value of the money changes inside the company. Because this is very critical, though it might sound like, okay, I'm a scientist, I might not care about money, but that's not how you will build a company. You have to go out, because this is the most significant piece, as you saw in that initial table I laid out, that you have to raise, start raise funding at some point. And this money could come initially from grants on the government, it can come from friends and family, but once that money is there, you need to understand how that money goes up. As you can see in this figure at the left bottom, there's an idea stage. So idea stage is when you know you are talking with your lab mate or your faculty member or yourself uh, sitting in the kitchen table and have an idea. Then you find a co-founder, you know, somebody who has a skill set which you don't have, and both of you work together to come up with an idea. That's when the co-founder and you get together. And the, typically, the first money is family and friends in a lot of cases, where you go to your family uh, member and say, hey, I need to start with $10,000, $15,000. So if your parents are you know, wealthy enough and they kind of they trust your judgment, uh, your family and friends can raise the first hundred. $100,000. So that's really the starting of a company. As a, and you can see that on this one, as it goes up on the left side on the Y axis, it shows 115,000, 200,000, 2 million. And to the extreme top, it goes to 235 million when it does IPO. So basically what I'm trying to explain to you is from the foundation of a company, when the value of a company is very little and you own a lot of company, as you keep on raising more and more money, as the valuation of the company goes up, your percentage of ownership goes down, but you own a lot more. It's almost like 0% of, you know, if you own 100% of a company and it has no value, it makes no sense. But if you own today 1% of Amazon or Google, you are multi-billionaire because these companies are trillion dollar companies today. So that's the concept you have to understand is as a founder, 
to raise the first money. And then as you keep mitigating the technology risk, as you start building value in the company, the value of the company will keep going up. So in this situation, so family and friends, you raised $100,000 from your family, you have to give some shares to everyone, fine. So you own at that point, so 50% of the company, your family owns 50% of the company. Or if the family owned company, you own 100% of the company. But next time when you raise the $2 million from an outside investor, you have to give them a share of your company. And that is where the valuation comes in. At what valuation of the company you give them the shares? So if your now company is valued at a million dollars and you are raising $500,000, now the company is owned between the two parties that are you and the investors at 67.33. There's a lot of complicated calculations which go into the ownership. But as a founder, the main point I want to make here is you have to be comfortable understanding the valuation process because it is very important to set the valuation right I have to keep building the company from family, family and friends, series A, series B. It can go up to series B, C, D before even it goes to IPO. And in most cases, it doesn't go to IPO. Somebody else comes and buys your company. So you have to be comfortable enough to be able to understand and talk these things, maybe work with the corporate finance the expert, but you have to be able to do those things. So these were three critical things I wanted to talk here going back to where I started that this is the process you kind of follow from the invention side of things you come up with IP strategy you come up with um, IP licensing strategy do you have a connection between the, <clears throat> the value proposition and the market you do the analysis of what operations you will need to do you do the financial calculations and pretty much you know that's the process through which you get in uh, innovation out of a university and start building up a company and you can keep it very simple and small in the beginning. You don't need to do all the things day one. You can slowly start building it up. But there is a process. The reason I'm telling you, I've been founder of five companies. We have built it from that two person as co-founders to a point where they've raised now 20, 30, 40 million dollars. They are selling products in the market. It can be done, but it's a process that you have to follow. You have to understand certain things. You have to bring in good co-founders so that you as a team can uh, execute. So in summary, I would suggest absolutely invent and innovate. You know, the finest, the best thing you can do is being an innovator. Uh, you know, we have the privilege of being inventors in the world and you, know, you can change the society, you can change the world by doing that. But you few things you have to do, you have to understand your competition, uh, your product, understand IP, protection and transaction, as I said, build a great team. End of the day, your success and failure will depend on what kind of team you create. If the team is bad, even the best technology in the world is not going to make it because at some point of time, people will clash and they are going to bring the company down. Understand the resources you will need. That's very important. How much money, what facilities, what resources. Uh, you know, if you are going global outside your country, you know, you have to understand the legal uh, side of things in that country, what kind of partnership you will need from them. Uh, and the last two points, most important, seek help from people. Ask and go people uh, who have done this before and ask them to help you. Most entrepreneurs are very supportive. They help their colleagues, they help other entrepreneurs. And last one, uh, we will make mistakes. If you are worried about making mistakes, then you should not be an entrepreneur. You will be making mistakes, but learn from them. Don't repeat the same mistake that you have done because end of the day, that will be stupidity. But if you made a mistake, you failed, you came back, you did not repeat it, that's a smart entrepreneur. So these are my parting thoughts at this point. Uh, <clears throat> I will end with any questions that you have. I certainly want to thank you all for your attention. It's close to end of the day uh, there. So certainly you have listened to me close to an hour. And I will end by saying, as you see in this uh, graphics here, it's never too late to start. Rather, most successful companies that you see lined up at the bottom were started by people in late 30s to 45. That's the most prime age when companies get started. So if you're thinking that, you know, I need to start a company when I'm 16, that's wrong. Actually, most successful entrepreneurs are in 40 to 45 or in that range of category. So I wish you all the best. I'm uh, here to answer any questions you have. You can reach out to me through my email 
I'll be glad to answer any questions. Uh, but at this point, I would say thank you so much and thanks for your attention. The first one is, can we succeed without fundraising? Uh, can we succeed without fundraising? Yes, you can do that. And it depends on the technology. If you are able to come up with a way to quickly get to revenue, you can absolutely do that. And that is something a lot of entrepreneurs try to do. So it, if it's a software company, there's sometimes the chances are very high that you can build a prototype and start distributing your software and start getting some revenue. So answer to your question is yes, but it really depends on what kind of technology or what kind of product you are trying to commercialize. It happens mostly in the software area where the cost of building a prototype, which is typically coding, and programmers don't need much resources other than a laptop or desktop and a place to code. So that happens a lot in the software space. But as you get into more deep tech, where you are, uh, we better have a long way to market, you typically have to do fundraising. So absolutely, yes. Uh, one question I have is if I'm creating an app to be used globally, are there any legal matters I need to address? And where can I ask more about this? Uh, Noof, one of the things which is very interesting that has happened in the world of app, for you to play in the world of app, you need to have an Apple and Android version. Pretty much that's the gateway to any app that you can bring to the world. So there are no as such legal boundaries unless until it depends on in certain industries like financial industry you have to follow the regulatory processes of each country. But if it is something like a game or something which does not require any regulatory framework of a country, like you are not selling a medical product or a financial product, you don't need to worry about legal aspects other than what is required by uh, Apple or Google for accepting you in the App Store. All the App Stores, they have a review process. If you haven't done that, it typically takes seven to 14 days. Sometimes it takes longer. And you have to agree to their terms because both the companies take close to 30% of your revenue if you are making money. And 99% of the apps do not make any money. There are millions of them. Very, very few apps make money. But if you're making money, you have to agree to what Google and Apple uh, tell you in terms of sharing uh, their uh, sharing your revenues with them and also follow the technical framework for the apps. So these are the really two requirements because today these are the two companies which host pretty much most of the apps in the world uh, through their platform. So that's really your requirement, not much. Okay, question, how to skip the fear of failure in the beginning of work or display the idea? See, that's the beauty of being an entrepreneur. You don't have to be you know, fearful of, fearful of anything. Actually, entrepreneurs like to see if you haven't failed, you haven't learned. So now, there are different cultures in the world fine, where failure is seen differently. In, in the United States, failure is seen uh, as something that where you learned. Uh, whereas like I am originally from India, uh, where failure was not seen very kindly if you fail. And in a lot of cultures, I'd say in Middle East, in overall Asia, that's still a problem where people look at failure differently. But the world is changing. If you are a young entrepreneur, if you are an old entrepreneur, whoever, whatever stage in life you are, last thing I would suggest you to do is don't worry about failure. What, how you can prevent it? My suggestion will be to do the homework. The three things I talked about today, gives you a fairly good idea. Now you might not have IP issue in some cases, but try to do at least some level of understanding about your market, the value proposition that you're bringing to the market. If you have the information, it is much, much easier for you to go and defend yourself in front of an investor or in front of any competition. But certainly you should be very, very open when you go out and present. Please do that. Don't worry about failure because that is an impediment a lot of good entrepreneurs I've seen who are worried about failing. But again, there's nothing for you to lose. What you can do is only benefit by doing it again and again, learning it. It includes public speaking. It includes everything. All of this is a package that you as an entrepreneur need to learn. So do the homework. That should be sufficient for you. Don't worry about failure. I, I, I would say just uh, keep, take it off your mind. But very good question. I think that's the most fundamental question all entrepreneurs have. And, and I'm telling you the most successful entrepreneurs make mistakes. So do not worry about making mistakes. 
Any more questions? Uh, all of you can reach me through my email. You can search my name to show up my email. I'm always happy to uh, reach out to you. And as I said, means I will wish you all, all the best. Stay safe. We are all in this together with this COVID problem. So stay safe. I'm hoping good news is coming. The vaccines are coming quickly. So hopefully maybe next year I could be in Qatar to talk to you. So with that, I think we are hitting uh, 7, 8 a.m., which would be 5 p.m. your time. Okay. Thank you so much and have a good evening. Thank you, Dr. Biswas. Thank you all for joining.